Does hellfire burn for trillions of years? Is there hope for anyone who sins after they were filled with the Holy Spirit? Whether you're curious about the answers to these questions or other questions about God and the Bible, you've come to the right place. I'm Tiffany Brown. And I'm Ruben Covarrubias. Bible Help Desk starts now. Welcome to Bible Help Desk, where you can find answers for life. Ruben, I'm so glad that we have this program because here we can gain more accurate insights about God and the Bible while dispelling myths we thought were true but aren't in the Bible. You know, Tiffany, I'm so glad we have this program as well because I believe God built in each one of us a desire to know Him. And I'm so glad we get to be a part of God's solution to help with that connection. If you're watching right now and have a question about God, about something from the Bible, or even about life that you'd love some Bible wisdom on, we want to hear from you. Go ahead and text us at 833-BIBLE-HD or give us a call and leave us a voicemail. You can also send it in to us via Facebook, Instagram, or our website at hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. And where possible, leave us an email so we can contact you back. So, uh, Tiffany, who is joining us to answer our questions today? Dr. Clinton Walleen has a PhD in New Testament from Cambridge University. A former atheist, he has served as a pastor and has also taught New Testament and Greek for 11 years at seminaries in Russia and in the Philippines. He is currently the Associate Director of the Biblical Research Institute. We're happy to have you, Dr. Walleen. Nice to be back, Tiffany. Also joining us is Dr. Marla Saman Nadelku. She has a PhD in systematic theology from Andrews University. She has previously served as an associate pastor and church planter, and she currently teaches religion for Southern Adventist University and Advent Health University. Dr. Nadelku, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, as we get started today, we would like to just jump into the Word of God to just meditate on this for a moment. It says, Romans chapter 8, verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You know, this passage is so powerful because it reminds us that Jesus, who lived here and lived with us, he became a human. Now, even though he died, he was raised to life, and he's the one who intercedes on our behalf. And I'm just so grateful that we have our high priest, our elder brother, who is there and interceding on our behalf. So as we jump into the Word of God today, let's remember the beauty of Jesus, who's interceding for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for what you are doing in heaven right now for us, that you are interceding for us. And now we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that you will um, speak to us, that you will give us a deeper understanding of who you are, of the love of God, and that we'll love you more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our first question that comes to us via text. It says, is there hope for anyone who sins after they were filled with the Holy Spirit? Uh, what a question here that we have regarding sin and is there any turning back after you've sinned? So Dr. Nadelku, I want to start with you here. It seems we have someone that's a little bit concerned uh, when it comes to sinning and, and maybe being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we answer this question from the Bible? This is a very good question yeah. and it's answered very clearly in Ezekiel 18. It might seem like a surprising place to look for an answer like that. But there in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18 really addresses this. And in verse 24, Ezekiel says, but when a righteous man, let me just pause for a second there. So a righteous man, righteous in Hebrew is the word tzaddik. Mm. And this is the same word that is used of Noah being a righteous man, Genesis 6, 9, and also of God righteous and upright is he referring to God, Deuteronomy 32, 4. And so even though this text doesn't say specifically somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, but since he is a righteous man, and righteousness is also a word used of to refer to God, um, it definitely would be somebody who has been filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's continue reading in Ezekiel 18, 24 now. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, 
and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. Hmm. Wow, what a verse. And so here is a righteous person, somebody who has the Holy Spirit in his life, but God gives humans free will. And this righteous man exercised his free will to turn away from that righteousness. And this is a tragic thing, but it also teaches us how wonderful God is, that God really respects our choice. And he doesn't want to save us if we choose to turn away from him. He respects our choice to turn away from him. So we know here that someone who was righteous, someone who was filled with God's spirit, is able to change course and choose iniquity instead. But now let's say if he's done that, is it possible then for him to come back to God and to choose righteousness again? Um, a few verses before in verse 21, it gives us the answer to that. It says, if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And so here again, we see that God honors the choice that we make at the moment. If we've lived a terrible life, if we've received Christ and then rebelled against him for all of our life, and then at the end of our life, we say, God, I want to turn back to you. God will forget all of our past sins Amen. and hold on to our current decision and commitment to him. Wow. And we will receive life and not death at that point. Mm -hmm. Now, is there any example from the Bible um, that will show us how a Bible character was filled with God's spirit and then left God and then came back to God and was not um, did not receive the punishment of death for his actions? Well, yes, certainly there is. Um, Luke 22 tells us um, a very interesting, shows us an interesting dialogue that was had between Jesus and Peter, Simon Peter. Peter was one of Christ's disciples, and he also denied Jesus, said that he never knew him, cursed to convince people that he was really serious. He had never met the man Jesus. We know that Peter was filled with God because he actually had this declaration earlier in Jesus's ministry, Matthew 16, 16 and 17. Um, Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you didn't know this by yourself, but God the Father revealed it to you. And so we know that he was able to hear from God the Father, that he was filled with God's spirit. And yet in Luke 22, and verse 31, you see this dialogue. And the Lord, Jesus, said, Simon, Simon. So this is Peter's other name. Simon Peter, we know him as. Simon, Simon. Actually, Simon means to hear. And so Jesus is using the specific name so that Peter, Simon Peter, will really pay attention. <laughs> Simon, Simon. Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And so it's very interesting because Jesus here is looking into the future. He sees the goodness of Peter's heart, but he also knows that Peter will deny him. And that's the reality. But even though Peter was filled with God's spirit, and even though he did this great sin of denying his savior, that he even knew Jesus, before he had even sinned, Jesus said, when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. And so Jesus was telling him, you will wow. make this grave error, this grave sin. But after that, come back to me and I have a work for you to strengthen your brethren. So certainly there was hope for Simon Peter. We know that after 
um, Jesus died and was resurrected, there was Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles like with flames of fire. And that also happened to Peter. And he was able to preach powerfully um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus used him very, very mightily, even though he had fallen away from Christ. Wow, thank you so much for not only giving us that example of someone from the Bible, but that we can see very clearly that there is hope, even with amongst our free will that we have that shows God's love. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Nadelku. Uh, Dr. Waleen, I wanna turn to you here uh, very quickly. What else can we add that maybe from your perspective we see when it comes to this question about hope? Well, I think the reference that Dr. Nadelku mentioned to Pentecost is very important. Clearly, Peter was filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but a number of years later, we find in Antioch, Paul mentions in Galatians 2, verse 11, this, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Peter was treating the Gentiles in a way that was totally inappropriate once the Jews came in. He was afraid of what they might think, him eating with Gentiles. And so Peter was not behaving correctly. He was, he was sinning. And, and, and think about how those new believers must have felt by the way Peter treated them. But of course, you know, also for us, you know, we make mistakes. We don't do everything that we wish we could. Uh, and we look back and we wish we had done it differently. But I'm so happy for the promise in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, speaking about our um, attitude toward Jesus. If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful promise and assurance we have. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that promise to remind us that Jesus is our Savior and we do have that, that he will forgive us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wally and Dr. Nadelku, for that. We received a question through text message. It says, explain Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. Moses is mentioned in this chapter, but isn't he in heaven? How can he be in heaven and not receive the promise? It doesn't really seem to quite make sense. So Dr. Wallian, can you help us understand how can these two things be true? Sure, Tiffany, thank you for the question. I think that we, we need to understand the whole context of Hebrews 11, that the last few verses is a general statement about all of these Bible heroes. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are exceptions. Even earlier in chapter 11, Enoch is mentioned. We know he was translated to heaven. Of course, it doesn't mention Elijah, but he also was translated to heaven. So we know that there are at least three people in heaven now, Moses, Enoch, and Elijah. Mm -hmm. um, they've received the promise, but not the actual promise that Hebrews is referring to. Because mm -hmm. if we look at Further, what it says in verse 10, speaking of Abraham, he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we know that city as the New Jerusalem. In Revelation chapter um, 21, we read the following about this city, beginning with verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. So the New Jerusalem comes down to the earth. The earth is a new planet. Mm -hmm. And this is the hope that people have had through the centuries, through the millennia, mm -hmm. uh, beginning with Adam and Eve, carry right on through with Noah, Moses, Enoch, Elijah, and all of the Bible heroes mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Even in uh, Revelation 22, verse 2, it refers to the tree of life. So we know Eden will be there too. Mm -hmm. This is the promise. There will be a restored earth and a restored Eden. This is what even Moses, Enoch, and Elijah in heaven have not yet received. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Waleen, for helping us to see that they're, they're still living in a place of faith and looking forward to seeing that become a reality. Before we go to break, we want to remind you to check out our digital Bible study resource site at Hope 
study, where you can study the Bible online. If you prefer to receive free Bible studies through the mail or even in person, just give us a call and leave us your mailing address. So we'll be right back with more questions and answers after these messages, so don't go away. Welcome back. Bible Help Desk is here to answer your questions from the Bible. If you have a Bible question you'd like answered, you can go ahead and text us your questions or call us and leave us a voicemail at 833-BIBLE-HD. You can also message us via our Facebook or Instagram accounts or visit us at our website, hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. Today, our panelists answering your questions are Dr. Clinton Wallin and Dr. Marla Nadelku. We're going to start off with our first question, which came through voicemail. It says, I have a question about whether hell is forever, you know, like burning in a fire for trillions of years. Dr. Nadalku, now this is a really important question. It seems as though the, the viewer is wondering, how can this be really true when we're dealing with a God of love who is loving and forgiving and we've only lived maybe 75, 80 years and then we burn for trillions of years? Can you help us understand that from the Word of God? Yes. Very, very important question. I mean, we think of today, we don't believe in cruel and unusual punishment. And so even for the very worst criminal that's alive now, what would we think would be a fair punishment? Well, they could be in prison for the rest of their years, or they could receive the death penalty. But the death penalty that we have is should be very short um, without too much suffering, and that's the point of it. But imagine saying that that criminal would deserve, as a payment for their crimes, to burn in hell and be tortured forever. We can't even think of how long forever it is forever is to never ever stop being tortured and burning. Mm -hmm. um, or even just think of a teenager who may have shoplifted mm -hmm. um, and not repented from that sin. Is the just punishment really burning for trillions of years? And does that reflect a loving God? Mm -hmm. And so we go to the Bible for answers to this extremely important question. There are a lot of issues um, that are pinned to this question. And one of them is this idea of us as humans um, having an immortal soul and living forever. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the Bible says about that. First Timothy 6.16, 6, 6.15 and 16, it's talking about God being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who alone has immortality. And so it's saying here in the Bible that only God has immortality, the ability to live forever and ever. So how about humans? Do we not have that capacity to live forever and ever? Well, let's go back to the very beginning to see how humans were created, because that will give us a clue um, and an answer for this question about whether humans have in themselves immortality. Genesis 2-7 shows us the formula of how the first human was created. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And so here we have Adam being formed from the dust of the ground and the formula is dust of the ground plus breath of God equals living being. Living being is actually the same term that is used in Genesis 1 for the creatures that God created. It's usually translated living creatures, but it's the same two Hebrew words um, that are used for the animals and also here for Adam. And so breath plus dust of the ground equals a living creature, a living being. And so now let's look and see 
what happens when a human dies? What happens to the constituent parts? And so we turn now to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. This is talking about what happens when humans die. And it says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And the breath will return to God who gave it. Um, the word there for breath is ruach in Hebrew, and it can mean either spirit or breath. It's used in parts of the Bible to just explain um, the, the regular breathing that comes in and out of our nostrils. Job 27.3 is a good example of that. The breath that we breathe in and out of our nose, that gives us life. And without that breath, we would die. And so here we have the opposite, the undoing mm. of what we saw in Genesis 2.7. When God created us, when God created Adam, he took the dust, combined it with his breath, and there was formed a living being. Mm -hmm. And at death, the dust goes back to the ground where it came from, and the breath goes back to God who gave it. And so there is nothing in us that by itself will live forever. Mm. Now, we do believe that if we believe in God, we have eternal life. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But you see that life, eternal life, is a gift from God. It's not something that we have innately in us. It is a gift from God, and we will receive it when Jesus comes and resurrects those who are dead in him and those of us who still are alive and follow God, we at that moment, 1 Corinthians 15 says, will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And this mortal will put on, at that point, immortality. And um, in this corruptible, will put on incorruption. And so eternal life is a gift for those who believe in and who follow Jesus. But how about those who don't? Those who don't, Ecclesiastes 12, 7 said, they're Breath goes back to God, the dust goes back to the earth, but there is nothing still remaining that gives them consciousness. And Ecclesiastes 9.5 makes this very clear. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead know nothing. So do we really think that those who are evil and die actually have consciousness forever and ever, and they can experience the fires of hell forever and ever when Ecclesiastes 9.5 says that the dead know nothing? Now, the Bible says um, in Matthew 18.8, that it's better to cut off a part of your body that is sinning to, than to be cast into everlasting fire. But Jude 1.7 also says that Sodom and Gomorrah received the penalty of eternal fire. Are Sodom and Gomorrah burning to this day? No, they are not. And so how could they receive eternal fire if they're not burning anymore? My father comes from the Middle East, from a country that speaks Arabic. And in that culture, the word forever means until something is all gone. And so his father would tell him, burn this heap of garbage forever, meaning until it's all gone. And this is the context here that is being spoken of when we talk about the fires of hell being forever. It means until it's all burned up. The destruction is complete. It is forever. There is nothing left. And in this, we can still believe in the goodness and in the love of God who punishes justly and lovingly and not in a cruel or unusual way. Wow. Amen. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nadelku, for helping us to take a deeper dive even to what happens when we die and how we were created. You know, it's very helpful to understand that we cannot live forever. It's not possible to live forever. The eternal life is a gift and um, it's not a, it's a gift to those who choose Christ. And so we just really appreciate you helping us to see uh, a little deeper into God's word. So we appreciate that.
question, the answer to that question. And we'd also like to invite uh, Dr. Waleen to join in on this question of, is it possible I mean, to burn for trillions of years? Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, some of the things that Dr. Nadelku has said are very, very important. I have to say that as an atheist, when I didn't uh, believe in God, mm. this was one of the key reasons why I didn't mm. believe in God. I couldn't imagine uh, wishing something like an eternally burning hell for trillions of years on my worst enemy. But if God is going to do that, how could I possibly believe in such a God? Mm -hmm. And then it came as quite a shock to me that in fact the Bible does not teach it. And, and this has been illustrated very well. That passage, Jude 7, um, referring to eternal fire, you know, sometimes we, ref we think of eternal in sense of how long it lasts, but it can also refer to the results. Mm -hmm. It's not referring to the fire that, it, as Dr. Delcu said, it, it burns and burns up that which uh, it consumes and then it is done because there's nothing left to burn. This is why also the Bible refers to unquenchable fire. It cannot be quenched or that is put out until it has finished its work. Mm -hmm. The results are eternal, not the length of time. And this is made very clear in Matthew 10, verse 28, where Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body and who cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and and body in hell. Here Jesus makes very clear that hell destroys. It destroys both soul and body. It destroys completely mm. the person. That's why John 3.16, which also Dr. Nadelku mentioned, there are only two alternatives, eternal life mm -hmm. and to perish. Mm. That is to be destroyed in the fires that will remake um, this earth, th the lake of fire as it's described in Revelation that will then uh, renew, cleanse, and the earth will be remade. Wow. Excellent. Very, very good. Thank you so much for bringing in your former perspective. I think that's so helpful for us to, to think about who is God, who is his true character, and the Bible has revealed that to us today. So we're just so grateful to both of you for joining us and for being present and taking us deeper into the Word of God. Absolutely. We'd also thank you, the viewer, for watching and sending in your questions. Make sure you keep calling and leaving us your voicemails with those questions. Get on Facebook and Instagram as well so that you can continue sending in those questions and that we can continue finding answers for you straight from the Bible. Thank you so much. Take care.